Good evening. I am Carol Alman Morton, the Executive Director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. If you'd like to learn more about programming at Ollie at BCC, you can check out our website, and I'm going to put that in the chat. There we go. Uh, I, we have a number of programs coming up in the next month or so, and I want to highlight a few coming up in June. We have an online workshop, Fusion Dance and Movement Lecture and Workshop. Learn more about the styles of dance you may be seeing at performances this summer. That's Monday, June 5th at 1030 in the, in the morning, Eastern time. I'm gonna put that in the chat. We have a really exciting Distinguished Speaker Series lecture coming up, um, opening the infrared treasure chest with the JWST, the James Webb Telescope, sorry took me a minute, Space Telescope, with Dr. John Mather. That's Wednesday, June 21st at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Dr. Mather is a senior astrophysicist and the senior project scientist for the James Webb Telescope. He will speak about the creation of the telescope and what they hope to find. It's going to be really exciting. I encourage you to embrace your inner 10 or 12 year old and come. And then last but not least, registration is now open for our summer one courses held in June. And you can take a look at what we have coming up right here at uh, berkshireolly.org forward slash summer one 2023. All right, tonight we are here for the program Gardening with Native Plants. This program launches Ollie at BCC's University Days Committee's series of events for 2023 to 24, which will be on the theme of habitat. The Upper Housatonic Valley, Valley National Heritage Area, known as Housatonic Heritage, is co-sponsoring tonight's lecture which will be available on YouTube tomorrow. Everybody who's registered will receive a link to, um, to the recording tomorrow and you're welcome to share it with whoever you think might be interested. And we're grateful to Housatonic Heritage for their partnership on this event so that it can be free and open to all. And now I'm going to turn things over to Vivian Orlowski to introduce our speaker. Well, thank you, Carol. I'm so glad to see so many people attending tonight. Uh, Emmy's presentation is related to a new initiative called the Berkshire Community College Plan for Climate Resilience and Pollinators. Berkshire Community College and OLLI are cooperating with Housatonic Heritage and the Conway School Graduate Program in Sustainable Landscape Planning and Design to develop this plan for publication this summer. If you'd like to get updates as the plan progresses, just email info at housatonicheritage.org and put pollinator in the subject line. I will also put that in the chat later. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Amy Meltzer. Amy has always felt an affinity with plants. As a child, she loved wandering in the woods. And as a young adult, she started her lifelong commitment to gardening. Amy's current commitment to biodiversity as the key to pollinator survival, human well-being, and climate resilience began over 10 years ago. It was catalyzed in 2018 by the New York Times feature article, quote, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? So recognizing the vital role of native plants to nourish pollinators, Amy mobilized on many fronts. First in her own home gardens in Cambridge and in the Berkshire foothills, she committed to growing all native gardens. Going beyond her home gardens, Amy volunteered with the nonprofit Grow Native Massachusetts, where she was named Volunteer of the Year in 2020. She also spent several years participating in citizen science research, documenting pollinators and flowering plants. In 2020, Amy joined Elders Climate Action, where she serves on both the research team and the Natural Solutions Working Group. Her educational outreach activities focus on natural solutions to mitigating the climate crisis. Amy and I both serve on the steering committee of the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, where Amy has taken the lead on a project to advocate for using native trees in municipalities, as well as for business, nonprofit, and residential properties. Please join me now in welcoming Amy Meltzer as she shares a joyful way for us to address both biodiversity loss 
and the climate crisis. Amy. Thank you so much, Vivian. And thank you everybody for being here. This is exciting for me to be here with you. So I'm gonna share my screen. Oops, hmm, okay. I was hoping I wouldn't have any glitches. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and start that again. Let me open this. Can you all see that? Or no. Not? Okay. It, it was uh, the, the share screen thing came up, but then it, it um, but there wasn't anything there. And right now where you don't okay. have anything. Okay. Sorry about this, folks, but I will. It's okay. It. It's Murphy's Law. It worked 10 minutes ago. I know. I always <laughs> think I've got it and then something happens. Okay. Let's Beautiful. There we go. Go into slideshow. Okay. How's that? Is that working? It's, um, yep, there we go, perfect. Okay, great. Let me go back to the top slide. Okay, here we go. All right, now I'm all set. Thank you for your patience. So tonight I'll be talking about gardening with native plants. I'll be explaining why it's so important because they're really essential habitat for the survival of pollinators, birds, and other species that are interdependent. And I'll also be talking about how to garden with native plants. So I'm gonna cover several topics. I'm going to start by talking about the biodiversity crisis, um, which is really as serious as the climate crisis, but it really, it gets a lot less attention and a lot less press. Um, then I'll be talking about how native plants and trees co-evolved with insects and other species too, so that they uh, have mutually beneficial relationships and are dependent on each other. And then I'll be talking about how to use native plants in our landscapes to support biodiversity. And there are also ways we can address our landscaping so that we're helping to mitigate climate change. And at the end, I have a series of resource slides that I'm not going to go through in detail. I'll show them to you. But when you get Anyone who's registered will get a link to this recording, but you'll also get a link to a PDF packet of the resource slides. So you'll have all that information available after tonight. So the biodiversity crisis, this is a picture of Mars and we hope to not end up like that at least for a couple billion years. Um, the latest reports from the UN on climate change, the you know International Panel of Climate Change that's been releasing reports regularly. And also there's a panel of scientists that re released reports on biodiversity. They released a joint report fairly recently saying that climate change and biodiversity loss are equally threatening for our survival. At this point around the world, there are about a million animal and plant species that are declining in numbers and at risk of extinction, many within decades. And the reports are saying, if we don't deal with these crises together, they will get worse. So we need to be aware of both and addressing them at the same time. And then just this winter, a report came out in the US, which um, was based on 50 years of research with hundreds of scientists saying that in the United States, 34% of plant species, 40% of animal species, and 41% of ecosystems are at risk of extinction. So I'm starting out with the bad news and I'm going to tell you what we can do about this. Um, so in the last 50 years, we've lost almost 3 billion birds, which is almost 30% of our bird population just in North America. And a major reason for the loss of birds is that many birds or their offspring depend on insects for food. And around the world, 41% of insect species are declining in numbers. And they're declining so rapidly that if we don't reverse this trend, insects could be gone by the end of the century, which would be catastrophic. I'm gonna talk about how important insects are for really uh, the functioning of all ecosystems. So in Massachusetts, there are almost 400 species of native bees. Uh, many are declining. Now, I, we all grew up, hearing about a lot about honeybees. Honeybees are actually not native to North America. 
And as a species, they're not at risk. And there's new research coming out showing that they compete with native bees for resources, that native bees populations decline near honeybee hives. So I just want people to know that because most people don't. Um, so it's not too late for us to take action on this um, decline in species. And here's an example. On the upper right, there's a picture of the great northern bumblebee, which is a species that's in Massachusetts that has declined a lot in numbers. There's a researcher out of UMass Amherst named Rob Gajir who has been studying which plants these bees need for their survival because there's a lot of specialized relationships between insects and plants. So we now know which plants these bees need and if we plant them, we can help reverse the decline. So that's just one example of the kind of action we can take. E.O. Wilson was a renowned naturalist and biologist who died last year. He said, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. But if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And I find this interesting because I think most of us were brought up to think of insects as either being scary or dangerous or disgusting or insignificant, when in fact, they're really essential for our ecosystems to function. We need insects for our own survival and that's survival of all other species. And there are many reasons for this. Insects pollinate many food crops, which means the plants that produce fruits and vegetables need to be pollinated by insects in order for them to produce their fruit. They pollinate 90% of flowering plants, so plants are depending on insects in order to reproduce. Insects are food for many species, and you can see this bird bringing an insect to her young or his young. Um, and then there are many species that depend on the species that eat insects, so they're really an essential part of the food web. There are insects in soil that aid in decomposition, so anything that dies needs to break down and it becomes nutrients in the ground. Insects help with that. They're also important in helping to sequester carbon in soil, so they're helping us deal with climate change. And then a report came out last year showing, well, it was estimating that about 400,000 people around the world are dying annually because there's such a decrease in pollinators, there's less fresh food available for people to eat, which is affecting human health. So we really do need insects. There are a number of causes for their decline and the greatest cause is habitat loss. So you can see that top picture is an industrial agricultural field. It has one crop in it, most of these fields are soaked with pesticides and herbicides, so there's nothing there for insects to eat and they're actively being killed. Um, deforestation is another cause. Um, many, many species depend on forests for their shelter and food. Um, urbanization is another reason. Um, I mean, cities can be a lot greener than this one that I've pictured here. And anything we plant in cities can be really helpful, but Anytime we're, you know, paving, hardscaping, we're obviously taking away habitat that could be used by other species. And then another cause is the widespread use of non-native plants. And that's mostly what you see when you go to plant nurseries and what most people have in their gardens and what's used a lot in large landscaping projects too. And I'm going to explain how plants that are not from our ecosystem don't provide support to our local species. So um, it's almost as if there's no habitat where you have a lot of non-native plants, habitat that can support other species. And then pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers all either injure insects, the plants they depend on, or the soil that we need for growing um, healthy plants. Invasive plants and insects also take a toll. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little about light pollution, which there's so much more light in the last 50 years than there ever was. And all of us evolved without artificial light at night. It has a big impact on birds and insects. Um, and it's another reason for their decline. And then climate change 
is obviously a cause. A lot of people think the biodiversity crisis is caused by climate change, and it's actually not. It's our land use that's the main reason. And climate change, what I'm hearing, has a bigger impact in the tropics than in our kind of temperate zone. But obviously, if we're having a huge flood, if we're having fires, huge heat waves, that's obviously destructive too. So here I'm gonna talk about how all these different species, plants, insects, birds, and fungi evolved so that they depend on each other. Um, there are plenty of other, all species are part of ecosystems and have relationships that affect each other, but I'm going to focus on these, mostly plants and insects, just to um, show how important it is to use native plants to support our ecosystem. So I'm going to do go through a few definitions first. Native plants are plants that evolved in a certain region with other local species and became mutually dependent and give each other benefits. People have different definitions of where to draw the boundary for what's native. Um, you know, it's not geographical. It has to do with an ecoregion and soil, climate conditions. Um, so some people will look at, you know, what's native to Massachusetts, what's native to New England, what's native east of the Mississippi. Um, the important thing is, are the plants providing services to the local insects? Can the insects get food from them? Can they feed food to their young from these plants? Non-native plants are plants that have been imported here, either from other ecoregions like California is not our ecoregion, um, or definitely other continents. And they don't provide the kind of support that local species need. And even plants that have been here hundreds of years don't provide that support. And I'll be explaining that. Also hybridized plants are, most of them do not provide the support that the original species provide that evolved here. And then evasive plant, sorry, not evasive, invasive plants are uh, non-native plants that are very aggressive and they crowd out native plants, both above and below ground. You've probably seen, you know, the edge of a woodland where you can see in this picture, there's vines climbing up and smothering the trees and actually taking them down. There's also plants, um, invasive plants that exude chemicals from their roots and they kind of poison the other plants around them. So they take over territory that way. So invasive plants are really a big problem and we really need to be working on taking them out as much as possible. So insects and native plants became interdependent over a very long period of time. They have been co-evolving for 125 million years so that plants depend on insects to pollinate them for their reproduction. And insects depend on plants for food, both for adult insects and for their offspring. And I'll explain a little more about that. And in response, plants have developed ways of defending themselves against being devoured by insects by, they have, they have several defenses, but one of the major ones is that they produce toxic chemicals that make them either unpalatable or poisonous to insects. And actually we get a lot of our medicines from these chemicals. And then in response, insects have evolved enzymes <clears throat> that allow them to feed on certain plants and not be affected by the toxicity, but they've only been able to do that for very specific plants. And the result is that insects and plants, 90% of insects have specialized relationships with plants. They're, they're just certain ones that they can get food from or feed to their young. And without those plants, they can't survive. And most plants can only be pollinated by certain insects. So over time, they've evolved traits that allow them to <clears throat> match each other so that they can still benefit each other. And as I said, this took a really long time. I've had people say, well, you know, why can't a plant that's been here 400 years provide benefit to local insects. And the best analogy I've heard for that is, you know, imagine that you like to hike, you're out in the woods, you run out of food, you're lost, you're in the woods for days. It would be really convenient if we could chew on wood, right? 
if you could just break off a stick and eat it and get the nutrients you need. But we can't do that. And it's the same thing with insects and plants. There are many, and there are a lot of other plants that are that aren't even woody that we can't eat and benefit from. So it's the same thing with insects and plants. They just have certain ones that they can eat um, and get benefit from. So again, most imported plants and a lot of hybridized plants provide almost no benefit to local insects. So I'm going to give a few examples of how insects and plants have evolved to have these matching traits. There are dozens of examples and they're pretty fascinating, but I'm just going to show a few. So these are both Monarda plants that have long, thin, tubular flowers, and they can only be pollinated by bees and moths that have long tongues. So I recently learned that there are bees and moths with all different length tongues that match the flower that they pollinate. And then also they can be pollinated by hummingbirds that have a long, thin beak. And hummingbirds are the only bird in North America that's a pollinator, but there are others on other continents. So another example is that there are flowers that have really thick closed petals. If you look on the left, that blue gentian flower is always tightly closed. And only bumblebees have the size and the strength to get into these flowers to pollinate them. And I have a number of family members now who every summer send me pictures of flowers with bee bottoms coming out of the back. And they know that really amuses me. And it's also fun to watch because when the bumblebees are in there, they do something called buzz pollination. They buzz and they shake the pollen loose and you can hear them in there buzzing away. So that's a fun thing to look for. And again, this is the bumblebees are the only kind of bee that can fit into these flowers and get pollen out of them. So here's a specialized chemical relationship. So on the left is a milkweed plant, and that white dot on the leaf is a monarch butterfly egg. And then on the right, you can see a milkweed plant with a monarch caterpillar on it. So monarch butterflies can get nectar from a lot of different kinds of flowers, but when they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch, the caterpillar can only eat milkweed leaves. So you might have food for the adults, but if you don't have milkweed in your garden, there won't be a next generation of monarch butterflies. So this is a, a chemical relationship that's developed because um, milkweed plants have a thick milky sap that most insects don't want to eat. Um, but this caterpillar has evolved so it can make use of that plant. It also has a little trick. Sometimes the caterpillar will bite the top of the main vein and let some of the sap run out before it feeds on the leaf. So now I'm going to talk about hybridized plants and what the problem can be with those. So I'm using Echinacea as an example. The upper left is the original straight species of Echinacea with many different kinds of butterflies on it. And on the right is a goldfinch eating Echinacea seeds in the fall. So native plants can provide nectar for adult insects. Um, the offspring of insects get fed pollen and leaves, which I'll explain. And so native plants will support, provide um, nutritious pollen and leaves that insects can make use of. They provide seed for birds. And because they're pollinated by an insect going from one flower to another and the pollen gets moved around, they have genetic variability which has always been important. It's especially important now with climate change because we're having more intense weather events. So if all the plants were the same and we have a big heat wave or a drought and these plants can't handle it, they'll all die. But if there's genetic variation, there might be some that will survive and go on to reproduce. So that's very helpful for the survival of plants and the other species that need them. So what's different about hybridized plants is that they're, they're being changed and developed for human enjoyment. So these are echinacea plants that are really highly hybridized. Some of them aren't, don't go that far. I mean, there's echinacea plants that just the petals a different color. Um, these have been so hybridized, they don't produce pollen, they don't produce nectar, they don't produce seeds. They're sterile, they're just decorative. And some hybridized plants 
have reduced nutrition in their nectar and pollen. They might look very similar to the original, but um, they've been changed for the shape or the color. And sometimes the nutritional value is lost. Sometimes the shape is changed in a way that makes them non-functional, like um, there's a red lobelia plant that has been bred so the flowers are a little bigger. It looks very similar to the original, but long tongue insects can't reach the pollen. So you can't really tell from looking at it if it's still functional or not. And then also hybridized plants are cloned. You know, someone comes up with one that they like, they make a gazillion of the same kind to sell in nurseries, but they're all the same. So there's a lot of false advertising about hybridized plants. Um, I've seen a catalog that shows all of these echinacea plants that I'm showing here, and they're labeled as good for pollinators. And the original is, but these obviously aren't. So you need to be careful if you're really um, wanting to buy plants that are going to support biodiversity in your garden. The safest thing is to buy the original species, which means there's a two word Latin name. If there's another name after it in quotes, it's a hybrid. Now, a few of those are fine, but unless you're sure, um, I would just be a little cautious. So Doug Tallamy is an entomologist who did really groundbreaking work in this field of learning about the interdependence of uh, native plants and insects and birds. And he's actually a wonderful speaker and he has books out. He's in my resource slide. So if you can catch up with him, I really um, advise listening to him or reading him. So he came up with this chart that shows how non-native plants don't develop support for our native species. So on the left is a list of plants that were brought here from other continents. The column of numbers to the right shows how many species they support, where they came from, their original home range. And that ranges from 40 to over 400 species. And then the next column shows how many species they support in North America, and that is zero to eight. And then the column on the right shows how long they've been here, and that's between one and 300 years. So that's another illustration of how that kind of evolution doesn't happen fast. You know, the plants come here, they're not that helpful, and they don't become helpful even after a long period of time. So here's comparing uh, a native and a non-native tree. Ginkgo trees are native to China. They're widely planted here. They're very hardy and they have really pretty leaves. Um, they support one species in the US and they've been here almost 240 years. Oak trees are really the most beneficial plant you can put in the ground if you have room for it. They support over 500 species of insects, birds, and mammals and over 400 of those are insects. On average, native plants support 13 times more insect species than non-natives, and non-native plants on average support zero to five insect species. So I wanna explain a little about, uh, I keep mentioning what you know the offspring of insects need. Um, here's an example of a spice bush butterfly. And then above it, there's a picture of what I think is just the cutest caterpillar. It's a spice bush caterpillar. Those actually aren't eyes, they're markings to make them look bigger than they are so birds are less likely to wanna to eat them. And that caterpillar can only eat spice bush leaves. So this butterfly will only lay its egg on the spice bush. So that's very similar to what happens with the monarch and milkweed. Moths and butterflies lay their eggs on leaves. And when the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat the leaves. And I'll show you soon some research showing that thousands of caterpillars are needed to feed just one nest of baby birds. And most caterpillars can eat the leaves only of specific plant species. It's that specialized relationship. So the plants that can support that next generation are called host plants. And then there's a similar story with bees. Bees collect pollen from plants to store in their nests. And again, most of us know about honeybees who live in hives and make honey. Most native bees are solitary. They dig tunnels in the ground or in wood, and they lay eggs in the tunnels and they gather pollen and make it into a ball and leave it next to the egg. So when the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the pollen. And once again, most bees can only eat pollen from specific plants. 
and those are the host plants for bees. So to feed the next generation of pollinators, we need to plant the host plants. And I'll be um, giving you information. Do I have it next? Not yet, I'll get to it. You'll have access to which are the best host plants. So what this means is that caterpillars need to eat leaves. That's their food when they're first born before they turn into moths and butterflies. So if you look on the right, that's a really healthy birch tree. And you look on the left, there's a close up and there's some holes in the leaves. And I've learned to get really excited when I see holes because I know that there's caterpillars eating the leaf and they're gonna grow up and either become a moth or a butterfly or they're gonna be food for baby birds. And that's all good. So this, this um, interdependent relationship has evolved so that it's not harming the tree. This is how it works. And those big infestations are generally um, from insects that are not native. Um, and those are the ones that become you know, harmful to the tree over time. But if you're just seeing some holes like this, you should feel good that you've got you know, you're feeding some other creatures in your yard. So this is the research about uh, how many caterpillars are needed to feed baby birds. Desiree Narango was a student of Doug Tallamy's and she was looking at chickadees and you know how small they are. And she found that chickadees need six to 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one nest. And that's before the birds fledge. I'm sure you've seen baby birds hopping around on the ground and their parents bringing them food. Well, that number of caterpillars is what they need before they leave the nest, and then they're still eating. And what she found is if there weren't enough native woody plants, the nestlings didn't get enough food. So most uh, moths and butterflies lay their eggs on trees and shrubs. You know, there's just a lot more mass for them um, to lay eggs on and for the caterpillars to eat. So she found if there were 90 to 100% woody native plants in the area, the birds did really well. When the native woody plant mass dropped under 70%, the, some birds didn't survive. They just didn't have enough food. So people are using this as a kind of rule of thumb that if you want to have an ecosystem that's gonna support other species and flourish, you need at least 70% native biomass. So by biomass, I mean the mass of plant material, the leaves, the stems, you know, so an, one oak has much more biomass than one milkweed plant. So that's how to judge how much you have in your area. So here's a slide with top keystone plants of the Northeast. Um, keystone plants, so not all native plants um, provide the same level of support to insects. About 5% of native plant species provide food for 75% of, of insect species. So those are the keystone plants. Those are the host plants. This is not a comprehensive list. It's just you know the top few from these um, different types of plants, but there's trees on the left, there's herbaceous plants and the one blueberry shrub on the right. But to get a comprehensive list of keystone plants. And again, you'll get this slide. Um, you can go to the Grow Native Massachusetts website and you can get a, a very complete list there. So here's another specialized relationship of a bumblebee on blueberry flowers. And bumblebees are the most efficient pollinators of blueberries because they can shake the pollen loose. So without bumblebees, we would not have blueberries. I'm going to talk about what goes on underground too, because um, that's part of having a healthy ecosystem. So you can see mushrooms on the left, and those are the fruiting bodies of these huge underground networks of filaments called mycorrhizal fungi. So that's underground all the time. They're really big, they're on every continent, and they're really important for ecosystem health. The fungi connect to roots of plants, they transfer nutrients and water between plants. They transfer carbon between plants and also store it in the soil. Um, they help protect plants from disease. So in return, you know, plants can photosynthesize and plants give nutrients to the fungi and the, new, and the fungi are then providing support to the plants. And there are many, many species of fungi that have different functions. It's pretty fascinating. Um, there's a book in the, one of the resource slides by Suzanne Samard 
who did all this research and you can read about it. So they're very important for um, having a, heat, a healthy ecosystem. And because they, they're also really essential for storing carbon in soil. So again, they're very important for helping us deal with climate change. And um, there's some research showing that they're increasing our res the plant's ability to withstand climate change because they reproduce so quickly. So if you take a walk in the woods after a rain or on the field and you see mushrooms pop up, that's the next generation. So they're reproducing and evolving much more quickly than a tree can. And because it's in their interest to support their partner plants because they depend on them, they will adapt to how conditions are changing and help other plants and trees adapt. Again, because they're ferrying nutrients and waters around, water around to plants that need it. And they've evolved these mutually beneficial relationships with native plants. They've evolved together. So protecting soil health both supports biodiversity and helps us deal with climate change because it increases carbon storage. So to help protect soil, it's helpful to minimize how much you're digging because that breaks up fungal connection. So I don't mean to go extreme and never put a shovel in the soil. If you are planting something, you need to dig in the ground, but not to do more tilling than you need. And there's new kinds of agriculture called regenerative agriculture that takes this into account. Um, avoiding use of pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers helps protect soil health. And there's research showing that the more diverse the plant species are in an area, the greater the health of the plants and the greater the carbon is stored in the soil. And I think that's because the diversity of plants means there's more diversity of mycorrhizal fungi. So everything is working together really well. If you leave leaves on the ground to break down, they provide essential nutrients for the soil. Again, removing invasive plants because they disrupt soil health and plant health. And a couple of years ago, Massachusetts released a roadmap for us to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And part of that strategy is the Healthy Soils Action Plan, which just came out. So it's part of our climate strategy to protect soil health, and there's some good guidance in that. So now I'm going to talk about how to actually work in your garden so that you're supporting biodiversity. In the beginning, I talked about how a major reason for the loss of insect species is, or insect populations, is the loss of habitat. And we don't have enough habitat left outside of our the space that we've taken up where we live to support all these species. There's 40 million acres in the US are in lawns, and that's equal to the acreage of our continental national parks. In Massachusetts, 20% of our land is in lawn. And conventionally cared for lawns are ecosystem deserts. It's almost like that agricultural field I showed you. It's a monocrop. There's often pesticides and herbicides. There's nothing blooming. It's, it's just a desert for insect life. And if you look on the right, this is just a strip next to a street, but there's so many different flowers that are gonna support different species of insects. They'll produce seed for birds. They have roots that are gonna help absorb water when we have the big rainstorms we've been having. So it's just much more beneficial to have a diversity of plants than to have a lawn. There are more beneficial ways to take care of a lawn than we traditionally do, and I'll talk about that. So just another example on the far left is some turf grass, which, you know, the roots are so tiny, there's nothing blooming. All it's doing is keeping soil from blowing away. It stores a teeny bit of carbon. And compared to all these other flowering plants, you can see, again, the variety of flowers, the depth of the roots, um, how much more beneficial this is. Doug Tellamy has a website and has started a movement called Homegrown National Park. He's the entomologist that I talked about a while ago. So he is saying if we all planted half of our lawns with at least 70% native habitat, we could reverse the species decline. So there are a number of ways of thinking about it. This is a picture of one of the suburbs west of Boston. I forget what town this is. 
but that house used to have nothing but lawn in front of it. And then the homeowner has planted native trees, shrubs, glass, grasses, and flowering plants. And so she's now created really life-supporting habitat in front of her house. She's made a big difference. So obviously, a lot of us don't have that kind of space. We don't have that kind of money. Um, but there are many things you can do that are beneficial. And you can start small. You can, If you have a balcony, you can have window boxes with flowering native plants in it. If you do have lawn, you can think about how are you actually using it? What do you need for recreation? What do you need for walking paths? And can you gradually start turning the rest of it over to native plants so that you're supporting all these species? So I'm gonna talk about Nomo May, which got really popular recently. Um, and it's, I think it's a mixed bag. I think there's some really good things about it. Um, so the reason for it is if you don't mow your lawn first thing in the spring, you're allowing time for some, if you haven't been, I should say, if you've been, if you have a really uh, chemically treated lawn, then nothing's going to bloom in it. But if you haven't been treating it with chemicals, there'll be flowering plants that come up in it. There might be violets, there might be clover, there might be dandelion. So, and there are bees that emerge early in spring that need a lot of nutrition right away. They're they're building nests, they're collecting pollen for their um, offspring. So it's really helpful for them to have flower sources early on. So that can be a benefit of not mowing right away. Another benefit of doing this is people get used to the idea of not having a manicured lawn that looks like a green carpet. So it kind of opens people up to the idea that maybe there's another way to take care of our property that's acceptable. And also people can start learning about the importance of it, it is of supporting insects by changing how we take care of our landscapes. So the downside of no mow may is there's some limits to it. I mean, for one thing, the month is a little arbitrary. It depends on where you are. I mean, I think May probably is pretty good in our area. Um, the important thing is that you're letting flowers bloom um, while, while the bees need them. And then there are non-native plants that bloom that are not providing the best nutrition, so native plants are better. And the most important thing is insects need support through the whole year, not just May. So if you don't mow in May and the insects are getting food and then you keep mowing every week, you know, you've turned your yard back into a food desert for the insects. So a lawn, and I'll talk about how to make a lawn more beneficial, but if you have a lawn that has different plants in it, there's no pesticide use, and you're mowing it less frequently, that's much better than a conventional lawn, but native plant habitat is better. So I'll get into all of that. So here's lawn practices that can be helpful. So you can look on the left, you can see on the far left, there's a lawn that's you know, been allowed to grow so that there's flowers in it. So there's food for insects. On the right, it's mown really short and there's nothing there for insects. So people have actually been doing research and looking at the results. If you mow every two to three weeks, you'll be leaving food for insects to forage for. If you let your grass height grow to three to four inches, that's helpful. You can leave your grass clippings because they'll fertilize the lawn and then you know you can avoid using chemicals, which you should. You shouldn't put any chemicals down. And then you can let um, or add small flowering plants. So clover, self-heal, violets, bluets are all good. I'm gonna show you a slide of, of what can grow in your lawn. And what's really fun to see is if you let your lawn flower and you let it get a little bit long, beneficial insects will come to your lawn to pollinate and get food. And you'll see birds coming after them. So it kind of becomes this wonderful little wildlife habitat that's really fun to watch. So I'll give you access to this slide. This is from the Wild Seed Project, which is in Maine, and they have fantastic educational material on their website. And this is from a brochure about diversifying your lawn that you can access. So I'll give you this slide too. So on the left are plants that you can put in your lawn that are beneficial. In the middle are plants you can allow in your lawn that you know can be helpful. They're probably not as beneficial as the native plants. And then on the far right are plants that you should take out either because they're toxic or because they're gonna grow really aggressively and crowd out other things that are better. 
So again, you'll get a copy of this. So if you're gonna start planting native plants, the beginning is very similar to any garden. You need to figure out what are your site conditions? How much light do you have? How much shade do you have? Do you have dry, moist, or wet soil? Because you wanna get plants that are gonna be happy in the growing conditions that you have. And then what kind of habitat do you want? When I first started learning about um, the decline in insects num insect numbers, I had a big flowering garden and I just thought, okay, anytime I have a hole in the garden, I'll buy a native plant. So that's how I started. I mean, 10 years later, I've given all my non-native plants away, but that's because I am passionate about this and you don't have to start there um, or even get there. So you can decide that you want to start a new garden bed, maybe turn over some lawn to a new garden. You can add trees to a lawn, you can create a woodland, you can create a meadow, and then you can diversify the lawn the way I was talking about how to do that. And then one thing to keep in mind if you're um, gardening is that nature grows things in layers. There's ground covers, there's taller plants, there's shrubs, there's trees. When you look at a landscape that has a shrub here and then mulch and then another shrub over there and more mulch, that was kind of developed so that landscapers don't have to do much weeding and they don't have to worry about which plants growing next to which plant, but that's not how nature gardens. Um, so it's kind of natural to let everything grow together um, and let it be crowded. It provides you know, more plants. You don't need to mulch once the plants have grown that much. Um, and there's just more benefit there for the plants and for insects. And then again, you always want to be checking for invasive plants and pulling them out. So the goals for a native garden that's going to support biodiversity are you want to have flowers blooming from early spring till frost because they're insects that need these resources all through the summer. They emerge from hibernation or they hatch from eggs at different times. Uh, in the fall, monarch butterflies need a lot of nutrition before they fly off to Mexico. Uh, so it's good to have a big variety of lots of different kinds of plants. If you can, you know, again, this all depends on how much space you have and you do what you can. If you plant in groups of at least three to five, it makes it easier for insects to forage. So honeybees can fly five miles to find food. Most native bees can only fly a number of, you know, like 400 yards. So it's easy, you know, they conserve energy, conserve energy if they can forage in a nice grouping of the same kind of plant. And then when you're choosing plants, you could start from a list of keystone plants, the ones that support the most species. Um, you can, again, aim to grow 70% native biomass. And then another way to start looking for which plants to grow are to use the list that Rob Gajir developed, which tells us which plants are needed by the insects that are at risk in our region. So this is a spreadsheet, and again, you'll have access to this, that has lists of plants and shrubs and trees. It tells you bloom height, bloom time, bloom color, how much water and light it needs. So that's a nice place to start too, because then you know you're helping the insects that really need it the most. And then maintaining an ecological garden is also very different from how we were, most of us were brought up to take care of our landscapes. Uh, it's best to not clean up in the fall at all. I think most of us were taught, you know, anything that's turned brown and looks like it's dead, you know, cut it down and rake it out. And what you're doing is you're throwing away the next generation of insects because the plant stems have insects overwintering them in them and some insects lay eggs in them that, in there that stay there all winter. A lot of insects overwinter in leaves on the ground. So if you can leave everything, you're, you're really providing a big benefit to the life cycle of insects. And also birds forage for the insects. They need them as food. So you're leaving food for birds off the, also. And I just want to say, I, it's a different aesthetic. You know, one is, you know, we're taught clean it up, make everything really tidy. I love how it looks to have all those plant stems up. They have, you know, they change different shades of brown. They have different shape, 
seed hot pods and dried flower heads on them. And to me, it looks like sculpture. And then when it snows, they're beautiful in a whole different way. So I recommend doing that and really enjoying how beautiful it is. Um, also, I'm gonna get through the rest of this, but I just wanna show you the link on the right over those little ferns. Um, this is again, a uh, page from the Wild Seed Project um, website. And so they have very interesting information about the benefits of leaving the leaves on the ground. So in the spring, you can clean up leaves where they might be too thick and matted and keep other things from growing. So you don't want, and also you don't want a thick layer of leaves on your lawn all winter. You can leave some kind of scattered, but not thick mats. Um, and then in the spring, I kind of thin the leaves so that I'm definitely leaving some on the ground because they're good mulch, they're good fertilizer, but I don't want to leave, you know, like a thick matted pile of wet leaves where it might rot the crown of something that's coming up. So I just gently move them away and take some out of the bed. If you have room, you can create a leaf pile and let the leaves decompose because they're the best mulch and fertilizer you can use. You don't have to go buy anything. And when you cut the plant stems down, you should wait for at least five days of temperatures not dropping below 50 degrees at night and cut the stems to 12 to 15 inches just in case there's still life in there. The plants will grow up around those stems and cover them. And I stack the stems that I cut to the side too in case there's anything that still might emerge. And then all the things that nature leaves just kind of lying around are really good shelter. So if you have the space, you can have rocks, you can have dead tree snags, you can have tree limbs, they're all providing shelter. And then with insects sheltering there, birds also go there for food. Now, if you're in an area where your neighborhood is gonna get upset with you for not being as tidy as everyone thinks we're supposed to be, there are things you can do to signal that you're doing this on purpose. So if you let your lawn grow up into a meadow, you can mow the edge. You can have a slightly more traditionally designed garden near the street. Um, you can put up a sign that it's pollinator habitat and that can be educational for people. So a couple other things that are important for supporting um, insects throughout the year and also birds, they need water. So you could just have a shallow dish. If you put some pebbles in it, insects need a place to stand while they drink. And then again, nightlight. If possible, don't have light at night. If that doesn't feel safe or comfortable, choose bulbs that lean towards the yellow end of the spectrum as opposed to cold blue. Those are less disturbing. And if you can put your lights on motion sensors so they only go on when you really need them, that's really helpful. There's a lot of, I'm not going into the details because I don't have time, but there's a lot of research about how damaging it is to wildlife to have so much light at night. And it's not good for our health either. So we're all dealing with climate change and I'm gonna give an example of how to pay attention to that and take action on that. So, you know, we're getting more heat, we're getting drought, we're getting flooding rains. And the important thing is to find the plants that are gonna be happy in the current conditions that you have. So where I live in Cambridge, um, I have a garden in the front that's next to a street that gets really, really hot when we're having a heat wave in the summer. And these, it's shady, but these woodland plants every summer by July or August were getting brown and miserable looking. You know, they'd come back in the spring, but they just were suffering. So I've planted them behind my house. And, you know, it's not that far away, but it's just cooler enough that they're fine there. So here they are behind the house and they, they do well all summer, no matter how hot it gets. And then I have other plants that I can grow behind the house that I can't grow in front of the house that are woodland plants that I know just can't handle that heat. And then Vivian mentioned, I also am gardening out in the foothills of the Berkshires in a place that's much cooler and moister than Cambridge. And it's just amazing to see what will grow there and be really happy that I just won't even try in Cambridge because it's just too dry here. So, um, Again, the important thing is 
to find the plants that are going to be happy in the conditions that you have. And I'll, I'll be talking about how to do research so that you know what to get. So why avoid chemicals in the landscape? Um, there are companies that will tell you, oh, just use this pesticide. It's only for ticks or it's only for mosquitoes. And that's not true. They're really going to kill everything. Remember fireflies? How many fireflies we used to have? So they're being affected by pesticides, by nightlight, and because they prefer tall meadows. And we've cut so many of those down. So I went off on a little firefly. <laughs> discussion about it, but um, the fewer chemicals we can use and the more we can just completely avoid them, the better it is for wildlife. So herbicides kill the plants that insects need. Um, all these chemicals seep into waterways and they damage life in the water. And as I said, we need healthy soil. They also disrupt the below ground relationships among all these different organisms. Um, so even if you have a de-icer that says it's not gonna hurt your plants, I think it's going to hurt your soil. It's just looking at whether the plant is going to get burned, not what happens to the microorganisms. And then many pesticides last for years in soil and plants and will damage the insects that come visit. So when you're shopping, it's good to tell the nursery you need plants that don't have pesticides in them. I'll talk about that a little more. So sometimes with a really huge um, invasion of invasive plants, People will be very careful about using herbicides to get rid of them, but I wouldn't get advice from a company that is making their living kind of randomly poisoning things. I would talk to somebody who cares about the environment and is gonna be really careful. So when you're shopping for native plants, this is a nursery in Cummington that I love. Everything's seed grown, pesticide free, just a wonderful place and it's a beautiful habitat to visit, Ring in a Prayer Nursery. So you wanna get as much as possible the plant species, the original species. If you're at a native plant nursery, they may know which hybrids are still beneficial. Um, plants grown without pesticides, if you can get plants grown from seed, you're maintaining that genetic variation that's so helpful. Being careful that you don't just follow a sign that says this is good for pollinators. You need to really know that these plants are species that are native to our region. And if you're shopping, you can tell, or working with a landscaper, you can tell them that you want these qualities in your plants, um, and they might learn from that. And then I prefer to shop at nurseries that are just growing native plants, but there are other nurseries that are starting to carry them where you can get good ones. And so it's also good to talk to them so they know that the demand is there. And then this is a spreadsheet, you'll get access to this too, of nurseries with native plants. The first page has a lot of nurseries, some are mail order, but most of them are local um, that carry native plants. And the second page is just nurseries that are all native. So I like to do plant research and these are places that I like to go to. So when I realized I needed really resilient drought tolerant plants for my front yard. I went to Native Plant Trust Plant Finder. It's a wonderful tool on their website and you can put in the characteristics that you're looking for. The more variables you check, the shorter the plant list will be. So you can play around with how specific you wanna get. Prairie Moon Nursery also just a wonderful place to see pictures and learn about their how to take care of them, where they're, um, where they originate from. So I, I'm not gonna go through all this, but you'll get this um, page too, and that will help you look for plants in case you wanna have a list when you go to a nursery. And then again, this is the spreadsheet of plants at the bottom that support the endangered insects in Massachusetts. So I'm not gonna go through this slide because I've talked about everything, but it's just a nice reference to have. So that will be in the packet of resource slides that you'll get. And then there are things we can do for biodiversity and climate change. Um, so one is just to protect and restore all our natural habitat, forests, grasslands, wetlands, and our soil, because these are the areas that sequester the most carbon and also support the most species. Again, if we're restoring habitat, we should be using native plants, avoiding monocultures like lawns or tree plantations, 
And then I've talked about using seed grown native species. So one thing we need to know about as gardeners is that peat bogs store huge amounts of carbon. And when we dig them up so that we can spread the peat in our gardens, we're releasing the carbon into the atmosphere. So that's another reason why I'm advocating for using the leaves that fall down that you can just rake up and use in your yard. Um, it's not going to damage anything and it's very beneficial. And then it's also at this point, we're getting a lot of money from the federal government to address climate change. So people want to plant a lot of trees because they know that's helpful. But people need to be planting native trees. Otherwise, we're really missing an opportunity to support all these at-risk species. So it's also helpful to advocate for ordinances and legislation that will support habitat by uh, advocating for using native plants. And I just want to say, this is such a joyful thing to do. You know, we're facing some serious problems, but this is a really fun way of trying to make things better. It's just flowers are beautiful. The insects and birds that come to them are beautiful and fascinating. And so it's just a very joyful endeavor. I can spend so long standing out in my garden watching bees. It's a lot of fun. So these are the resources. Um, these are plant lists, places to get them. These are wonderful organizations and websites you can go to. Up here is the Mass Pollinator Network. Just a few, there's just places to learn, places to connect with people, um, just wonderful resources. And then these are all really useful books. So you'll get access to all of this. And I just want to end with a quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer, who grew up in the Adirondacks in a Native American um, tribe, and she's also a trained biologist. So she kind of has both the scientific and the Native tradition behind her in terms of how she views plants. And she said, in some Native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. And now it's our turn to take care of them. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. And here we are. Thank you, everybody. Are you ready for some questions? Sure. All right. Uh, so uh, first up, can you comment on the popularity and promotion of beekeeping for honey? Oh. Yeah, I feel bad when I <laughs> talk about the problems with honeybees because they're really cool. They're really interesting. You know, we've all grew up hearing about them and feeling affection for them. And a lot of people, I think, started beekeeping because they thought it was going to be helpful because we heard about colony collapse disorder. And, you know, honey is wonderful too. But I'm really concerned that native bees are in trouble. And that means trouble for all of us. We need them to survive really for our ecosystem to survive. And if honeybees are interfering with that, uh, it's not a good idea to keep bees. So I'm not gonna tell anybody you shouldn't, <laughs> but I don't think it's a good idea to start now if you have this knowledge. Um, and if people are interested, I could actually add to the resource packet. I have a slide of, videos and articles that are about this. So if someone wants more information about it, I'll just, I'll put that in the packet and you can- That'd be learn. great. Um, we have a question from Susan. Do Asian jumping worms affect the choice of plants to rewild a lawn? No, they're, that's a big problem. <laughs> Asian jumping worms make me feel a little depressed, but um, there are researchers working on how to get rid of them or keep them under control, but we really don't have anything yet that will work. The best thing is don't share plants if you know you have the worms, unless you're gonna wash the roots first. But we just need to really keep our ecosystems as resilient as we can. So I think, you know, just plant, follow the guidelines that I already gave you and plant those plants. Um, and the more of us who do that, the more resilient our ecosystem will be. And then hopefully we'll get a cure for the worms at some point. Mm. Uh, Louise asks, is there a good alternative to Roundup? Or, and I might expand and say, do, do you have um, suggestions or resources about, um, you know, different 
insects that we might want to have help us with the ones that we don't want around? Oh, uh, I know that there's information out there about that, but I don't really know about that. Um, that would be something to research. So I'm sorry, I can't. I can't help with that. I could, Vivian, do you know anything about it? <laughs> She's going to unmute. Okay. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. 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 You, you want me to comment now? If you know something about it, sure. Oh, and not so much about the, the insect issue, but about alternatives uh, to Roundup. Um, certainly, um, using hand pulling in small spaces, just pull out the plants by the roots. Um, that's uh, one of the simplest ways of doing it. If it's a larger area, uh, what I've done is I've used um, a, a what's sometimes called the like a lasagna method, where you layer <laughs> a cardboard. First of all, you mow down the area as low as you can. Uh, you don't have to hand pull, be good if you could, but if it's a large area, you're not going to be able to do that. Um, but mow it down as low or cut it down as low as you can, cover it with a thick layer of, of cardboard, uh, the, you know, all the boxes that we get now that we're buying so many things online or from your local stores or wherever, um, better to take off the uh, um, any kind of um, stickers or anything that's you know, synthetic on it, but just put down the cardboard. Then on top of that, put wood chips um, and let it uh, let it season. That will kill the plants underneath because they won't have access to the sun. And then uh, plant it with some of the healthy natives that <laughs> you get from the various sources that Amy recommended. And those natives will take root. And uh, and and provide a new a new uh, in, in environment in, in in that area. So um, one of the things that can also be done to prevent the uh, onslaught of, of uh, invasives is to get a soil analysis and find out if your soil is out of balance. Um, in in my case, I, I've gotten advice from some someone in land care who has um, uh, specialized in knowing what type of mineral supplements um, to use on the soil to rebalance it. And then that creates a, an environment that does not invite in invasives because rather than seeing the invasives as kind of a attacking force, uh, we should understand that it's actually in some cases nature's way of trying to remediate an existing imbalance that was often caused by human disturbances. So um, it's a switch in, in perspective, um, not that we, we don't wanna limit the invasives, but if we understand them better, they, it also gives us tools in, in a way to, um, uh, to, to treat them in a way that's healthier for the environment and healthier for us and our pets and wildlife and birds. So it's a, it can be a win-win that way. That's great. That's Thanks, really Vivian. Um, on a related question, um, somebody asked, do you feel 30% vinegar and or salt is a bad idea for weeds? I would think salt is definitely a bad idea. Again, I'm not an expert on this. Um, salt is going to stay in the soil and it's that is not a good growing medium. Um, vinegar is going to make it acidic. I've heard of using it. Now, I've only heard of using this in the city, like if you've got weeds coming up in the sidewalk. Um, so I'm not an expert on this either. I definitely stay away from salt. Vinegar, I would do a little more research about whether there's places to use it where that can be helpful. Great. Uh, we have a lot of thank yous in the chat. I'll share them with you later so you can see them. Um, we have a question. What do you suggest to reduce ticks in the yard so it's safer for dogs and children? I just heard some really interesting research about that. Um, I was watching a webinar about no mo may, and um, these researchers compared lawns that were being mown, you know, every week with lawns that were let go for three weeks, and the tick populations were no different. So, mm. I mean, I remember being a kid and you know lying down in long, tall fields and 
you know, now I'm nervous about doing that, but I want to be out in nature. And I think the best thing to do is just do a body check every night. And if you've got them, take them off. Because really using, one thing I think we need to be careful about is that humans have been doing things for our own pleasure and convenience to the point where we're being destructive to nature. So using poison to keep ticks away, I mean, I don't want Lyme disease. I don't want anyone I love to get Lyme disease, but I also don't want to poison the um, insects that ultimately we need for our survival and for the survival of our ecosystem. So I, I just do the mechanical body check. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Vivian, I see you, you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, um, a few years ago, um, the town of Great Barrington uh, worked with the uh, Conway School. Uh, it's a graduate program in sustainable agriculture, uh, sustain <laughs> sustainable uh, planning and design uh, for land landscaping, not agriculture. We, we were the a agricultural commission that commissioned it. And um, they had, a, we, we had, came out with a Great Barrington Pollinator Action Plan that's available uh, free, no charge, the PDF. It's about 90 pages on uh, the townofgb.org website. And I just put in the search for a pollinator plan or go to the page for the Agricultural Commission. Um, and on page... Uh, uh, 74, well, that's in the hard copy. I don't and the PDF might be slightly different. They have um, two pages of information on limiting exposure to ticks. And uh, one of the ideas is to mow wide paths if you're going to be going through a more uh, populated uh, with plants area uh, so the ticks can't drop off the leaves onto you as you walk by. So you'd want to be brushing by the, the plant right on, on, on your legs or your arms if you're leaning down. Uh, some people who have, uh, uh, who have the, the ability and the space and they're in a zone that is possible actually raise uh, guinea hens or other fowls because fowl uh, chickens even eat the, uh, eat the ticks. And um, uh, some other um, um, hints were to remove barberry, um, which is, previously used as, as a hedge, but it could also be wild. And evidently barberry is, is a breeding ground for, uh, for ticks. So the, they, the, the Great Barrington Pollinator Action Plan actually includes a whole section on uh, how to control barberry so that you're not actually uh, favoring the, the tick environment. Great, thank you. I think I have some in my woods that needs to get uh, removed. Yeah, it's, it's um, also an invasive non-native plant, so it's good to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been on my list for a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, I have, we have a question. How do I turn half of my lawn uh, to 70% native habitat on a budget? Do you have suggestions about that? Well, uh, I would start small. You can, the lasagna method that um, Vivian was talking about is useful if you want to you can get big sheets of cardboard, decide what area you want to replant and, you know, smother it for a couple seasons, put mulch on it. And then you can just, it'll kill the grass underneath, but the grass will decompose. So it's actually providing nutrients. And then you can cut into it and plant plants. So there are places like, the I don't know where you're located, but that place in uh, Cummington, has a lot of different plants from plugs. So those are $2.50 or $3 a piece. Um, that's a really good place to shop. If you have neighbors that are interested in native plants, you can swap. I mean, again, be careful of the, if someone has worms, wash the roots before you um, bring them to your property. But people can share plants. You know, there's a lot of interest in this developing. And so if you connect, like if you joined one of the pollinator network groups, you can find other people that are growing native plants and you can you know, trade plants with each other. So I would start with that, small plants, small area, share, and then you gradually, you can add. You can also start things from seed. If you go to the Prairie Moon Nursery website, they sell a lot of seed and they'll, they will tell you which ones are easy to start. Some of them aren't. 
some of them need some work. Um, but there, if even if you put easy in the uh, the search function, the, you'll get a list of of plants that are easy to grow, and you can also call them. They're really helpful. So that's another thing to do is learn how to start things from seed, and then you can get a lot of plants for very little money, and then you can trade them. Great. Um, we have a question about trees. There are different spe species of oaks. Are specific oaks better than others? In, I'm guessing in this region. And can you comment on maples as a tree that assists with pollinators? Um, so maples and oaks are both windblown pollinators. Um, so it's they're not any plant that uh, doesn't have showy flowers is probably not attracting insects. And, that, and that's actually why we have allergies because the wind is blowing the pollen around <laughs> from these other trees, but they're really important host plants. So those are plants where many, many species are laying their eggs and the larva is eating the eggs. There are many species overwintering the leaves that fall off. So I know maples weren't on that list that I showed you of keystone plants, but they are a very important plant. If you go to, I think it's the National Wildlife Foundation, Federation, I'm forgetting the name, but it's on one of the resource slides, and you put your zip code in their search function, they will tell you the um, trees that are and other plants that are native to exactly where you are. I mean, I actually think that's a little bit of a limited way to, to look up plants, but there's a lot of oaks and maples that are beneficial, and you can uh, do a little research and find out which ones are good in our region, and there are many. Great. Oh, somebody mentioned in the chat that they collect seed in the fall and start them from seed. That's another way to the question before um, that you can borrow from your neighbors too. You can, I, I tried to scatter some milkweed last fall. We'll see if it worked. <laughs> That's really an excellent suggestion. Yep. Um, let's see, how should I ask our town manager to consider trimming back overgrowth around ponds that block view, views from apartments that's controlled by EPA rules? That is, I don't know how to answer that question. You might want to connect with other people in your town who know how your town governance works, um, other people who have similar concerns, but I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer that one. That's okay. You don't have to know all the things. I wish um, I did, but I definitely <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, here's another, here's a veggie garden question. Any suggestions for getting rid of sheep sorrel in my veggie garden and are veggie gardens contributing to biodiversity? So I don't know about sheep sorrel, but somebody else might. Um, it's really important to grow food. If you can grow food, that's great. That's helping with climate change. Um, there are vegetables that are pollinated by you know, local insects. And also if you grow native flowering plants around your vegetable bed, you're gonna attract more pollinators, which will help with your yield. So um, yay, yay for growing food. That's really mm -hmm. great. Um, oh, somebody noted that vinegar is only helpful with non-woody and herbaceous plants. I have played a little with agricultural vinegar. It, it made my um, a side hill that was covered in invasive smell like salad dressing for like a couple <laughs> of months. <laughs> I need to grow some garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, somebody has a question, another tree question. My property has a lot of Norway maples. Should I have them removed? If they're little, I would take them out. If they're big, they're storing carbon. And I wouldn't take, you know, we're dealing with two emergencies and we have to pay attention to both of them. So I would never plant a Norway maple. And if you have little saplings, I would take them out and put in something else. But if you have big trees, they're storing a lot of carbon. And I just think this is, Maybe your grandchildren can take them down, <laughs> but I, I don't think we should. Great. Uh, oh, and it looks like Vivian put the pollinator action plan link in the chat, which is good. Um, sorry for the pause here. I'm just- No problem. Double checking. Um, oh, somebody asked, what did you mean um, this was back a little earlier. What did you mean about B hotels? Oh, yeah, that's right. I mentioned it on the slide, but then I don't say anything about it. So that's another place where people are trying to be helpful, and I think there's risks with it. 
Um, in nature, insects find their own shelter in natural materials, which over time will naturally decompose and then they find another place to shelter. Bee hotels are made by humans. They're, I think, often made out of bamboo. They can develop disease because, you know, they, they're not going to stay clean if they're being used for years. Um, I don't know if there's a safe time to clean them. Like, how do you know if there's some insect in there or eggs in there? There are predatory insects that learn that that's a really great place to go and pick off other insects because they're all gathered together. So I just, I think it's another situation where nature does a better job than we do. It's a fun idea and it's well-intentioned, but I think uh, natural materials are better. The insects know where to find shelter. Um, a question about, uh, are beech trees in the same category as oaks and birches? Oh, in terms of being a keystone plant? Mm. Yeah, I'd have to, I haven't memorized that list. <laughs> I would have to look at the list. So when you get the packet of slides, um, you can, you know, click on that link and see if it's a keystone plant. I think they are very beneficial, but I don't know where they fall. Um, also that, um, oh, the other website I was talking about, the National Wildlife um, link that tells you what's native in your area also tells you how many species each plant supports um, mm. on the list. So that, that's really fun to look at and helpful. Great. Um, and so we have, we've sort of touched a little bit on some um, policy related questions, but I guess I would just, and, and that's not necessarily your area of expertise, but I, have you had experience in, in advocating in any public spaces of, um, or organizations that you've worked with that have been helpful to you in, in sort of making a case to a town or an organization or, or whatever it might be? Yeah, actually, I've just started getting involved with that. So with Elders Climate Action, um, there's sort of different teams that focus on different aspects, and I'm on the Natural Solutions Working Team. So We've been looking at uh, protecting pollinators and also Mass Pollinator Network is really active and really, really good at dealing with legislative issues. They're mm -hmm. under the umbrella of uh, the Northeast Organic Farmers Association. So if you go to their website, they're actually very actively involved now in um, creating safer pesticide policies, creating pollinator habitat all around the state. Um, you know, they're advocating for bills that do that. There's also a municipal reforestation bill, which um, is prioritizing planting native trees all over the state. And now we're trying to get a grant that will, because the federal government is giving the states a lot of money for things like this, that will um, help nurseries grow native trees from seed for this project. So, and also in my town, it's taken me a while to kind of figure out who to talk to, but you know, I found there's people on my city council who care about the environment. And so I go and talk to them and do presentations and it just helps move things along to speak up about the things you care about and connect with other people who are doing it because people share great information. I recommend going to the uh, Northeast Organic Farmers Association website and the Mass Pollinator Network website to get information about things that are happening right now. Great, thank you. Well, I guess my, I think we've gotten through, if I missed anybody's question in the chat, I apologize. I think we've gotten through the vast majority of them. Are there any uh, last words of wisdom or maybe your favorite thing that you have growing outside so far this season? Oh gosh. All right, I'm gonna talk about <laughs> one little plant that I've come to love. It's called Penstermon hirsutus. <laughs> it is on the list of plants that are good for endangered insects. It's going to bloom soon. It's pretty short. It gets stalks with beautiful purple, white, little tubular flowers. It can grow in sun or shade. It doesn't care if it's wet or dry. And it's just a really pretty plant that's really beneficial. So there's so many beneficial plants. <laughs> that's a hard question. <laughs> But that's one I'm right now. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We're so grateful for your time and expertise. And thank you, Vivian, for being part of the conversation as well. And uh, again, thank you to Kusatonic Heritage. And I'm so glad everybody was able to be here together tonight. Um, 
hope you have a wonderful evening and uh, the video will be up on our YouTube um, tomorrow. So you'll get the link and again, you feel free to share it with all the gardeners and uh, folks in your neighborhood in anybody you got in your life. And so thank fun. you. Have fun. <laughs> have fun. Yes. Thank you, thank you so Take much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.